Hi guys, welcome back to my channel. My name is Louisa. If you're new, don't forget to subscribe and if you're coming back, welcome back. And today I did not really anticipate making a follow-up video for the one that I put out last week, which was on Peter Laws, but I dug a little deeper and it seems like there is a bit more to the story and it's probably more disturbing than I actually thought. So I'm going to share with you today what I found out, what I found out from the Baptist Church, what I found out from Peter Laws' own social media, and uh, yeah, give you my thoughts on the topic. If you're new here and you're not familiar with me, I am a fourth year psychology student, uh, currently working on honours. I'm also a Christian who was saved back in 2020 from witchcraft and mediumship and divination. And so this is very personal for me. This is um, basically everything that I had to navigate back in the day when it came to, you know, is this right or is this wrong? And what I found from being haunted haunted in inverted commas and um, demonically oppressed is that there is no such thing as a safe form of divination or a safe form of contacting the dead. I ended up having to be rescued by the Holy Spirit because I was under constant attack after I purchased a Bible. So I grew up Anglican and I was a regular churchgoer. I was very involved in the church when I was a younger person and I left when I was about 20 and sort of pursued uh, study and career paths and didn't really have much time. So I was agnostic for about 10 years until I bought a haunted house and at the time you know there, there were lots of things that indicated and confirmed that I was indeed experiencing a haunting, but it was very interesting some of the things that I learned through that process. Uh, at the time, I didn't think that there was much help to be found in Christianity. And that's because I think a lot of people in Christianity don't really talk about this stuff. Uh, I can kind of see why, because they're actually more interested in God and I find that's, that's where I am these days when it comes to uh, my spiritual journey is because I, because I met God and because God delivered me, I'm actually more interested in what he's doing than in what the demonic is doing. Those guys are piss weak compared to God from what I've seen. But back between uh, 2013 and 2016 is when I lived in like essentially an actively haunted house. I lived in the same house until 2018. And um, in that time, I experienced some things. My housemates experienced some things. We had, you know, similar occurrences happen, like uh, someone sighing in a completely empty house, electronic switching on and things like that. But one of the experiences that I had which kind of gave me some insight into the demonic and how they operate was uh, early one morning after my alarm had gone off and I was sort of still in bed uh, someone shouted my name in my empty house and they used my mother's voice now my mother is not dead she certainly was not dead at the time and she's not even dead now Obviously it wasn't her because she was not in my house. Nobody else was in my house. Nobody else was able to impersonate her. And I think it's actually really difficult to genuinely impersonate people. So yeah, as far as I could tell from that experience, these spirits are able to mimic people. They are able to mimic the living and the dead. And so they can gaslight people essentially with all of their parlor tricks where they pretend to be some long lost relative, some dearly departed, 
so that people will talk to them. And at the time that I was experiencing this haunting, I ended up going to psychic mediums for help because I thought that that was the best place to get help. And it actually wasn't, but it set me off on a particular path. And the further along I went on that path through things like neo-paganism and then into Wicca, the deeper into the rabbit hole of the occult I went. And so it wasn't until 2020 when I started uh, talking to some Christians online and listening to some of the things that they had to say and agreeing with them, like what they were saying matched my experience in the occult. And, um, but they had a, a different take on things, which I thought was uh, interesting. And they weren't judgmental of me. They were just kind of happy that I was actually agreeing with them. So those experiences softened me to the idea of Christianity and I started getting random Bible verses popping into my head. And at this point it had been like 15 years since I had been in church. I did not own a Bible. I had not read it in at least that amount of time. So the fact that these verses were coming to me like word for word perfect, because I would Google them and it would come up and say, oh, that's from John or that's from First Timothy or whatever. And I would just be like, I don't remember reading this like ever. <laughs> I probably heard it at one point when I was in church, but do I remember it? No. Could I recall it word for word perfect, an entire like paragraph? No. <laughs> and having had the uh, spiritual experiences that I had had leading up to that, I knew that this was something from outside of myself. So eventually I decided to buy a Bible, uh, like after about a month of this. And that's when the spirits that I had been contacting and working with through tarot cards and things like that, that's when they ripped their mask off, took the gloves off and it was on. For weeks I was getting attacked in my sleep. I would have uh, activity going on in my home. People didn't want to come over to my house anymore. So it was getting quite scary and uh, no amount of sage was going to fix it. I don't know if I even prayed. I, I'm not consciously aware of having done that, but the Holy Spirit took mercy on me and delivered me one night at two o'clock in the morning after I had woken up from a night terror. And since then, I have not touched these things or gone back to that. I have pursued God and pursued the Christian life because it is life. Like that's the thing, that was one of the big things that I noticed uh, after I was delivered was that there was so much death in my house. Like I had skulls everywhere, uh, all of these very morbid images around. And I wasn't interested in death anymore. I was interested in living. As Jesus said, he came so that men could have life and have it more abundantly. And that is exactly what happened to me. So I was no longer interested in death. Death was um, gross <laughs> to me after that. It doesn't mean that I have never watched horror films since, and it doesn't mean that I have never uh, been interested in people's stories about spiritual encounters and, you know, ghosts and paranormal activity. I want to be able to help people who are experiencing those things because I know how distressing it is. But I know for a fact that mediumship and channeling and divination is the opposite of helpful for people who are in this situation. There comes a time in our spiritual journey where we have to choose. We have to choose between life and death. We have to choose between God and demons. And I made my choice and I am extremely happy with it. I have not been bothered 
by anything ever since. And I wish that everyone could be as free as I am. So one of the scriptures that I think is very encouraging and also convicting for people is from 1 Corinthians. Consider the people of Israel. Do not those who eat the sacrifices participate in the altar? Do I mean then that food sacrificed to an idol is anything or that an idol is anything? No, but the sacrifices of pagans are offered to demons, not to God. And I do not want you to be participants with demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons too. You cannot have a part in both the Lord's table and the table of demons. Are we trying to arouse the Lord's jealousy? Are we stronger than he? I have the right to do anything you say, but not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything, but not everything is constructive. No one should seek their own good, but the good of others. In the letter to the Corinthians, the Apostle Paul was trying to reason with the church in Corinth, and he was talking to them about how some people were eating sacrificed food in the temple and how they were allowed to do so, but it would confuse their brothers and sisters in Christ to see them at that table. And also, just because they can doesn't mean that they should. Now, in that instance, Paul was talking about food. And food is a very different subject from actually channeling spirits. So it goes from like eating food with people who have sacrificed that food to a deity to um, actually participating in rituals and worship of some sort of demon. Now, we could talk semantics here. The word demon is derived from a Greek word, which literally just means spirit. So this can refer to basically pagan gods. And I don't really see much difference between pagan gods and like spirits of the dead and the demonic because they're kind of all in the category of dead spirits. Like they're still around, they're still existing, but they are dead men walking essentially. And I know that when I was um, doing tarot readings, there was a girl who asked me for a tarot reading and um, whatever the spirit was that she was asking me for more information on, it was very strong. There was this um, sort of static energy that came along with it. So as soon as I got her reading, the spirit was there. As soon as I got her like list of questions in an email, the spirit was around me and wanting to communicate. For me to open up those channels of communication with those spirits again, would mean that I am rebelling against God. And as it says in 1 Samuel, rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. So like there's no real difference between those two activities. If I was to go down that path, I might as well say that I was practicing witchcraft. So how exactly does this relate to Peter Laws? Well, I was watching one of the debates that he mentioned in the previous video that I used a snippet uh, from his content. He had a debate with a woman called Jen Niza. Now she used to be a psychic medium and she was saved and turned to Christ. And so she's very cautious about these things, probably a bit too cautious. Uh, she seems to think that Taylor Swift is dangerous you guys, if you've seen my channel, you know that I don't have a problem with Taylor Swift. I think that it's possible to be a bit too paranoid about these things and a bit too strict and rigorous. And um, I, I don't really think that that's helpful. But I think that she had some very fair points in that particular debate. And I think that Peter missed her points entirely. <laughs> Take 
For example, this snippet. I remember when I was training as a minister and um, I was, I, we were in the room and a, a guy came in with tarot cards and just handed tarot cards out and said, look, I use these because I go to psychic fairs and there's interesting symbology in these cards that I use as a way of like sharing my faith with them um, and where they're at. And they, they passed these cards out and um, ev like I, I would say there's about 30 guys in this room, people in this room, they all went like this and they wouldn't touch the card. I picked up the card and was like, Oh, interesting. This is an interesting way of connecting with people. Um, and the reason why the people picked it up is because they believed that that card was in, uh, inherently evil and that the devil was going to jump out of it and attack them. And that to me is glorifying the devil um, and is doing it in such a way that it just cuts us off from entire groups of people. And the work I do, like, for example, on the BBC show Uncanny, um, which is very popular, and the people who come into that who have experienced strange things in their home if i was to just write these people off straight away um i i don't think that works you've got to meet not only people where they're at, at the beginning but also where they are in the journey god doesn't put press delete on your interests you know when you become a christian you remain the same person in some ways and radically different in others i know you want to respond to what peter had to say so go ahead and do that yeah sure i mean you had a great point that a demon is not going to jump out at you when you touch a tarot card but Tarot cards are a tool of divination, and when you use them, of course, the cards know nothing about you. They are just paintings on cardboard, but the demonic forces are giving psychics information through those tarot cards. So I would strongly encourage anybody out there to stay far away from them, not because it's going to, you know, you're going to die and you're going to, your hand's going to light up on fire the second you touch one, but because they are a tool of divination, and God is clear about divination. So I think that's where... For me, it's not as much about judging people, conspiracies or things like that. It's just, what does God say about it? Let's just, you know, for me, I just want to live by the word of God the best that I can, just like all of us Christians want to do. And I agree with you that you want to be with people on their journey because the Lord says to make disciples, right? Share the gospel and make disciples. We want to disciple people. We want to be there for them. But what does that look like? By the word of God. So that's really all I wanted to say about that. So I think Jen Nisa is right on the money with this particular analysis. You know, um, of course, touching something is not necessarily going to make you burst into flames. That being said, there is such a thing as cursed objects. And if you come into contact with them, you can actually pick some things up. But usually if someone is indwelt with the Holy Spirit, they're not really at as much risk of that as they would be if they didn't have that kind of protection. Peter Laws, on the other hand, seems to have a bit of a fascination for this stuff. Rather than going, um, why are you trying to reach out to people through divination? <laughs> like, in, instead of going, I have questions about this methodology because it's not scriptural. Instead, he seems to find it fascinating. He seems to think it's a great idea. Uh, he seems to think it's a novel way of getting people on board without actually telling them what they need to know about Christianity. And it kind of like his attitude kind of reminds me of something that happened when I had my witchcraft channel. Uh, I got an email one day from a female pastor who essentially messaged me to say, you know, you go girl, keep doing what you're doing. I don't think there's anything wrong with what you're doing. I think that's actually literally what she said. Unfortunately, I don't have the email because at the time, even as a practicing witch, it gave me the ick. It freaked me out. I realized that I was in contact with something that was utterly evil. So I didn't want it polluting my inbox uh, because at that point, you know, um, with like neo-paganism and the new age, they believe in all of this energy stuff. So I believed it was like bad juju and I didn't want to have it in my energetic space. So <laughs> I got rid of the email. Uh, like, even at that point, I knew that what she was doing was 
utterly wrong. And it's not because I believed in Christianity, it's not, be not because I believed in Jesus or even really knew necessarily what the Bible said. It was because she was essentially contradicting everything that her religion stood for. You know, if someone decides to become a preacher, to become a teacher and a leader in the church, then they need to actually believe what they're teaching and they need to practice what they're teaching and they need to not misrepresent the church and maybe adhere to its guidelines. Anyway, sorry, I've gotten off topic again. Um, during the interview, actually at the beginning of the interview, uh, the debate with Peter Laws and Jen Neza, uh, Peter Laws talked about his new church. So he apparently runs um, another podcast. So I think he's got like two or three podcasts, but one of them is called Creepy Cove Community Church. And so I decided to look that up. And uh, yes, it is a podcast. It's not a real church. It's a fictitious church. Um, but there's also an Instagram page for that particular church. So I say church. It's it's drama. It's a dramedy. Anyway, Peter Laws's whole thing is to be as inclusive as possible, which is kind of not what Jesus <laughs> stood for. He stood for exclusivity and uh, people had to choose him and forsake others. <laughs> I'm all for inclusivity of different types of people, like, you know, what they look like or the backgrounds that they come from should not be a preclusion to becoming a Christian. But the exclusivity of Christ is not negotiable when it comes to Christianity. So amongst the various different posts that I found on the Instagram page, uh, he was talking about like The Conjuring with Ed and, Re Ed and Lorraine Warren. I, I think I've mentioned them before. They seem very shady, like the real Ed and Lorraine. Uh, she was a psychic, which is already a red flag. And they just seem to really sensationalize all of these cases. And apparently they didn't even really help people because they just came, got all of the um, the goods for their next book or whatever, and then abandoned people. But the particular post that I stumbled across was this one. So it, the photo says, Creepy Cove Paranormal Research Project, Remote Mediumship Experience. Case 001 West House, Living Room Mrs. Marie Bowman. Warning, participation in this audio experiment is at your own risk. Well, as a psychology student, that would not pass ethics. Telling people that they do something at their own risk is not informed consent. You, you have to provide a bit more information than that. To conduct an experiment, you would also have to go through a review body that analyzes the ethics of your proposed experiment and then decides whether or not it's actually ethical to do on people. Anyway, the write-up underneath it says, coming to the Creepy Cove Patreon this Thursday, 9 p.m., sinister soul level and above. So I'm guessing that's like different pay grades on Patreon. Welcome to an immersive and disturbing audio experience that will take place in your own home. This is a simulated session with a remote medium who will observe and connect with the deceased people in your living room. You will listen to this audio extra while sitting in your living room. Please turn off the lights for best results. Disable notifications and use headphones. Warning, there may be occasional loud noises. The experiment will last for 26 minutes and 36 seconds. Please listen at your own risk. And he's got a little disclaimer down the bottom that says it's for entertainment purposes only. So why is he calling it an experiment? And also why is he holding a seance with his fans? It seems like Peter Laws 
is a law unto himself. He does not adhere to any Christian standards or any Christian teachings. He's just gone rogue. Now, obviously, I cannot tell you what happened during that audio experience, but uh, it looks like the premise of it was to conduct a seance and to invoke dead spirits for people who were listening at the other end. Uh, so I would be very curious to find out exactly what the purposes of the experiment was and what exactly he was trying to achieve. Was he trying to achieve contact with the dead? Was he trying to achieve some kind of uh, psychic phenomenon with his uh, participants? Perhaps they got a bit more information about it than that, because that is extremely scant information. And it also does not um, include the disclaimer that every experiment should include, which is that people can withdraw at any time. To me, this seems highly unethical. It's, it's not just even a, a question of being anti-biblical. It's also an unethical experiment. It's interesting to kind of know this stuff about Peter Laws when you actually watch some of his, you know, debates and content, because he's already guilty of the things that people are saying are wrong and which the Bible says is wrong. If you're uh, not sure what the Bible actually says on this stuff, check out the previous video because I went through all of the scriptures in that one. But it's very interesting how defensive he is about this stuff. And one of the first things that he did in the debate with Jen Neza <laughs> was like, she was talking about the risks of uh, different things in popular media and how, um, it desensitizes people to the occult and makes it more normalized. And Peter Laws's first line of defense in that whole debate was to throw in a red herring, <laughs> which is of course a logical fallacy. But um, he threw in the red herring of like, oh, but what about the poor and needy? I don't actually want to address the topic at hand. I want to say, Shouldn't we think about something more pressing? Aren't there bigger issues out there? And I had to laugh because it was the exact same thing that Judas said in Matthew 26. What about the poor? Shouldn't we be worrying about them more? And the whole purpose of Judas saying, oh, what about the poor? Isn't this, you know, wasteful was he, he had absolutely no, absolutely no interest in the poor. He was just wanting to line his own pockets. And when I went on to Peter Laws's uh, Instagram and social media, there's absolutely nothing about charity. He's not doing any fundraisers. He's not telling people to donate to things. He's not highlighting the plight of something. He's just a hypocrite. He'll throw out a red herring in a debate because he wants to derail the conversation from the point at hand, because he's guilty as sin, literally. When it comes to actually doing these things and actually being a charitable person, he has no interest in that. He, he's just interested in selling more things. He's interested in selling his podcasts, selling his books, selling his YouTube videos. He's not actually interested in helping anyone. So the other big question that I had, other than like, you know, has, how far has he dabbled in this stuff? How far down the occult rabbit hole has he actually gone? And it looks like he's gone pretty deep. But my other question was, is he still an ordained minister? Because that's a claim that he puts out there fairly regularly. He's certainly never contradicted it. He still goes by Reverend Peter Laws. So is he still a reverend? And uh, I decided to dig a little bit on that question. Apparently he was originally ordained a Baptist minister, 
So I reached out to the Baptist church in the UK and asked them, you know, uh, what do you make of this particular situation? What do you make of his activity? And I got a response. So you'll notice that this particular email is from the Ministerial Recognition Coordinator. So this person should actually know who is a minister and who is not. And she says, Dear Louisa, thank you for your email to HR, which has been forwarded to me. Peter Laws used to be an accredited Baptist minister, but this is no longer the case. Therefore, we have no relationship with Peter or any jurisdiction in this area. Best wishes. He used to be an accredited Baptist minister, but that has since been demolished or revoked. Dunno. They claim absolutely no relationship with Peter Laws whatsoever. So there is no church backing for him. He is just out on his own, doing his own thing, pretending apparently to still be a minister. Except that it seems like the only church that he is the minister of is this fake church online called Creepy Cove. So given this information, why would someone like Peter Laws be interested in holding on to a meaningless title that has absolutely no relevance outside of the church that he disdains. I mean, as far as I can tell, he disdains Christianity. He has absolutely no interest in it. I've never heard him actually talk about the, the good things that God does. I've never heard him talk about his testimony. I've never heard him talk about how God can help in these situations. He has zero interest in God. And either he departed from a ministry that he used to have willingly to pursue this uh, other line of work, or he was kicked out. And the last article that I saw from him on, on the Baptist website was, <laughs> He was talking about Creepy Cove Church and it was in, I think, September 2020. And then the the seance that he held was in February 2021. So at one point, the church had been supportive of his quirkiness. But I'm guessing that probably changed when he held a freaking seance. Anyway, my educated guess when it comes to the psychology of this, why someone like Peter Laws would pretend to still be a reverend after all of these years of not having any association with the church whatsoever, is because he liked having the trust and the respect of people that came with having the authority and the credibility of that title. When someone has the backing of an organization, it's easier for them to get, I guess, entry into people's uh, minds and homes and things like that. In psychology, it's actually called affinity fraud. And uh, some people use it to scam for monetary reasons. And other people use it to, I guess, lure people down a particular path. I don't think that Peter Laws is actually consciously doing this. I think that he believes that he's got altruistic motives for this stuff. But at the end of the day, he wants to be successful with this. He wants it to be an income, uh, a lucrative income. And to do that, you can't alienate people, can you? You have to be as inclusive as possible. I mean, my channel's been going for four years and <laughs> every so often I will talk about something that's really, really important in Christianity and it will alienate a bunch of my audience and people will drop off. But that happened to Jesus. If you actually tell people the truth, some of them will reject you. I mean, it happened en masse when I 
declared that I was Christian and was turning my back on witchcraft and the occult. So, you know, you have to suck it up. You have to be brave because either you stand for something or you stand for nothing. As it is, Peter Laws doesn't really stand for anything in particular except just gratifying his own curiosity. And I can understand the curiosity factor, but the thing is, he, he already knows where this leads. Like, he's got all of the information that he needs about this stuff. And at the end of the day, he just doesn't believe it or he thinks that it's justifiable in some way because he is so drawn to it. So he doesn't want to lose his credibility as a reverend. He doesn't want to lose the respect that he gets with that title. But he doesn't have the backing of the organization that actually gives him the credibility in the first place. And the reason why an organization has credibility in the first place is because they have oversight. They have, uh, you know, systems and bodies that hold people accountable. And Peter Laws doesn't want to be accountable. He doesn't want to be accountable to the scripture. He doesn't want to be accountable to God. He doesn't want to be accountable to the church. He doesn't want to be accountable to any kind of oversight whatsoever, which means that he doesn't have credibility. Credibility does not come from transgressing boundaries. Credibility comes from being thoughtful and being careful and actually towing the line with an organization. At the end of the day, the church cannot co-sign his egregious breach of what they teach, because if they undermine their very teachings, then they have no credibility. The church has to maintain its own standards. And that means that if Peter Laws does not want to adhere to those standards, then he's on his own. Apparently, he still wants to use the title of reverend, but he really doesn't have the right. So that is the rather sad case of the church minister who went off the deep end and delved into the occult. And I think it's a cautionary tale for all Christians that, you know, you can actually wander away from Christ. You can stray. Not being willing to recognize any authority from God and from the scriptures is a very dangerous and precarious position to put yourself in. And I think it's really important for Christians to remember that our authority is Christ. We can't just make stuff up for ourselves that we think feels good or sounds good. And we can't just tell people what they want to hear and think that that's going to be good for them or good for ourselves, because it's not. Jesus warned his followers that they would not be popular if they followed him and if they stuck to the truth. And that's just how it is as a Christian. If you actually do believe in God, you believe in Jesus and you take his word as the truth and you live by that, then it's going to be unpopular. As a Christian, you're either prepared to pick up your cross daily and follow Jesus or you're not. And that's a choice that we all have to make. There are crossroads that we all get to at various different times and we have to make a decision. So hopefully we're making the right decision. I believe that I am and uh, I believe that the long term benefits are better than the short term discomforts. All right, guys, thanks so much for watching. Let me know your thoughts in the comments. Don't forget to subscribe if you're new. Take care out there. God bless. And I'll see you next time. Bye.